Okay, the Reformation, part two. By the way, I went through Reformation part one, and I did make one mistake, which is that John Calvin did believe in free will, sort of. Depends on how you define free will. He did find it hard to combine free will with his belief in predestination, but we all got problems, you know. Anyway, France. There were Protestants in France. Uh, they were called Huguenots. We're not exactly sure what the word means or where it came from, but it did start out as one of those terms of abuse, sort of the same way that the Puritan name did. People would be, ah, ha, 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 you're a Huguenot. And then the Huguenots would say, well, okay, if you want to call us Huguenots, we're Huguenots, so there. Um, I mentioned in the first half of the lecture that there were also people called Jansenists. They were Catholic, but they were people who were in sympathy with the ideas of Calvinism. And uh, the Jansenists were no more accepted than the Huguenots were in France, so there are a lot of terms to keep track of. When the Reformation happened, the French, there were French people who did adopt uh, Protestant attitudes, but they were by no means in the majority. One of the reasons that the Reformation went as well as it did in England was that the King of England was the person who started the Reformation there. Um, the kings and queens of France were very Catholic, and the Huguenots always remained a minority. Uh, one of the most powerful of those kings and queens was a woman named Catherine de' Medici. Um, she was very Catholic. Uh, she was Italian. Uh, she was also a woman, which me means it's kind of interesting that she became so powerful. Uh, she was, in fact, probably the most powerful woman in continental Europe. Uh, and she became powerful because she had married Henry II, the King of France. And during the time that Henry was alive, she wasn't terribly powerful. But when he died and his children inherited the throne, she became very powerful for various reasons. To begin with, the first two uh, boys who inherited the throne were very young. The first one died after only a year, and uh, the second one died only relatively uh, into his 20s. So during the period that they were officially king, Catherine de' Medici, their mother, exercised power, and she was really the most powerful person in the government. Catherine was Catholic. She was not uh, opposed to compromise, basically because she wanted to have a peaceful, productive France, like Elizabeth did. But as the years went by, and she became more and more impatient with the Protestants, she was less accepting of Protestantism. Um, things started to get worse when... Her daughter, Margaret, married Henry of Navarre, who was a Huguenot. At first, Catherine was more or less in favor of this marriage because she thought it might bring the Huguenots and the Catholics in France together. Didn't work out that way. Six days after the marriage came the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, in which lots and lots of Catholics all over France murdered lots and lots of Protestants. Um... There's been some historical debate about the extent to which Catherine was behind all this. Uh, certainly the people all over France, who the Catholics who were murdering Protestants, thought they were murdering Protestants because that's what Catherine wanted. Uh, so whether she actually did, you know, convey secret orders to people to do that, uh, we would love to be a fly on the wall in, during some of the discussions of the royal family, but we don't know for sure. However, what, as I say in my next uh, poster, what goes around comes around. Because after the three sons of Catherine's, who became one after another king of France, all died fairly young, then the next person in line is Henry of Navarre, the Huguenot that Catherine's daughter Margaret had married. Now, everybody realizes that uh, Henry cannot become king of France and stay Protestant. The French people just not, would not have accepted that. So he does convert to Catholicism. 
the line that he is supposed to have spoken, probably a fable, is Paris vote on mess, which means Paris is where the mass. Uh, even though I'm secretly still Protestant, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, I'm going to be able to sit through a mass, and therefore I'm going to convert to Catholicism in order to become king of France. But he didn't forget his Protestant friends, because once he became king, he issued the Edict of Nantes, which, if you look in textbooks, it, the short version they give you is that it established religious freedom or toleration in France. It really didn't do that. But Protestants were still second-class citizens in France. Uh, but it did give them limited protection. There were certain areas of France where it was okay to be a Protestant. Um, and later on, in 1685, when Louis XIV revokes the Edict of Nantes, it means that a whole lot of Protestants who had thought they were fairly safe had to leave France, um, some of them coming to North America to become the ancestors of the population of the United States. And this was a bad thing for France because those Protestants, a lot of them had been productive, contributing citizens of France, and now France couldn't benefit from their presence any longer. However, with the uh, announcement of the Edict of Nantes, for the time being, Protestants could be a little bit more comfortable in France. Okay. Now we go to Spain. Spain has always been very Catholic. There has been very little Protestant activity in Spain ever since the Reformation. Um, and in fact, the king of Spain in the 1500s was Philip II, who was very Catholic. As this chart indicates, he was married for a while to... Mary I, who was the very Catholic Queen of England who came between Edward VI and Elizabeth I. Um, he was also a member of the family of Habsburg, uh, which meant that in, a, in addition to being the King of Spain, he was also the ruler of the Netherlands. Um, the northern part of the Netherlands had become very Protestant. And when I say very Protestant, they weren't just saying, oh, I don't want to be a Catholic, I want to be a Protestant. They were going around, going into Catholic churches and peeing in the holy water. So they were being very, they were protesting Protestants. They were being very strong about it. The southern part of the Netherlands, by the way, was more Catholic. And that was one reason that in 1830, the southern part of the Netherlands broke away from the Netherlands, and became the separate nation of Belgium in 1830. But the northern part of the Protestants was going strong for Protestantism, and Philip did not like that, because he was very Catholic. And uh, he declared war on the people uh, in northern Netherlands who were making trouble for him. And this was the beginning of what is called the Eighty Years' War. Um, most of you have heard of the Thirty Years' War. And the Thirty Years' War is actually the last 30 years of the Eighty Years' War. Uh, in 1618, a lot of other European countries piled on for reasons religious and otherwise, but it's really part of the same war. And uh, as you will see, both wars came to an end in 1648. Um, how does the British, how does the English government uh, react to this? Well... Interestingly enough, and I think this is one of the hoots of history, Philip, after Mary died, Philip had proposed marriage to her sister Elizabeth. I, uh, you know, you just cannot imagine what that marriage would have been like. They were two very, very strong willed people. And as I said, Elizabeth had accepted and was supporting the Church of England, which Philip would not have been able to get along with at all. They become even more enemies when Elizabeth decides to support the Protestants rebelling in the Northern Netherlands. There are various reasons. For one thing, Elizabeth is a Protestant too, although of a rather different kind. Also, one of the things that the English economy depends on is raising sheep to make wool, and there are lots of textile factories in the Northern Netherlands to which the English sheep farmers sell their wool, and Elizabeth doesn't want to alienate them. So Elizabeth is coming out on the side of the English, of the, the uh, Protestants in the North Netherlands, which makes Philip furious, of course. And Philip sends a bunch of ships over to England, which become known to history as the Spanish Armada, with the idea of invading England, taking over and 
bringing England back into the Catholic fold. Uh, it doesn't work because, for one thing, Philip uses the wrong boats. He uses big flat bottom boats, which don't survive very well in the uh, waters around England. Um, so that didn't work, but it was one of the major invasions of England that happened before the 20th century. Um, meanwhile, you would expect things would be happening in Germany, which is basically where the Reformation started. Uh, I put Germany in quotation marks because in the 1500s, Germany was not really a country in the sense that we think of it today. Uh, it had not established a strong, centralized, unified government the way England and France had. Instead, Germany was a kind of collection of smaller or larger uh, countries, hundred, over a hundred of them, in fact, that were ruled by various princes and dukes and counts. They all had allegiance to one major person who was the Holy Roman Emperor. But the Holy Roman Emperor was less of a king over all these countries that he was sort of like a, the chairman of the board or the head of the committee or something like that. He didn't really have a whole lot of power over these individual countries. Now, what happens uh, in the Reformation is that some of these German-speaking countries, which together we would call Germany, some of them become, the, the leaders of the countries become Protestants. Some of them do not. So as you're going through the middle of Europe, you're in Protestant country, Catholic country, Catholic country, Protestant, Catholic, Protestant, Protestant, Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. Um, and there are wars in um, Germany, as indeed there also were in France. Uh, one of the big ones was between the Schmalkaldic League. I love that name. It's named after a, a city in Germany, um, which was a group of Protestant leaders and rulers in the German-speaking area who were fighting against Charles V, who was at the time the Holy Roman Emperor and wanted to keep things Catholic. Uh, the war doesn't last very long. Uh, it's one of a number of wars, though, that takes place in the early part of the 1500s, a lot of them fueled by religious conflict. These are pretty much brought to an end by the so-called Peace of Augsburg. Uh, the way that the Peace of Augsburg resolves these various conflicts is by the rule of cuius regio eius religio, <laughs> which I will translate for those of you not fluent in Latin. It basically means if it's your region, it's your religion. In other words, if you are a count or duke or prince in charge of a particular area and you have converted to Protestantism, then everybody in your country has to be Protestant. If you have stayed Catholic, then everybody in your country has to be Catholic. This isn't as difficult as it sounds, because remember, these are mostly very small countries. And one of the things that the Peace of Augsburg says is, if you're living in a country and you don't agree with the religion of the person that, you're, that is ruling over you, you can just move over a few yards, you know, into the next country where they are Protestant instead of Catholic, and therefore you can match up your religion with the particular king who is ruling over the area. It doesn't solve every problem, but it's, it's uh, in, we're making progress towards sol solving some of the problems this way. Um, you may wonder about Italy. Um, that's where the Pope is. And uh, I put Italy in quotation marks because, like Germany, Italy had not established a strong, unified, centralized government. Both Italy and Germany, by the way, did not establish strong, centralized governments until the second half of the 19th century, so this is going to go on for a while. Uh, Italy was a bunch of little areas that were more or less independently ruled, but one of them, of course, was the area around Rome, which the Pope really had charge of. And the... Um, Italian reaction, or the reaction of the Catholic Church in general, is sometimes referred to as the Counter-Reformation. There are a lot of people who don't like that term because it makes it sound as if the Counter-Reformation was doing the opposite thing from the Reformation. In other words, the Reformation was pulling in one direction and the Counter-Reformation was pulling back. That's really not what was happening. What was happening was that, you know, the people who were in charge of the church at the Vatican, they were not stupid. 
they realized that there was a lot of stuff going on that really shouldn't have been going on. And they didn't like the way Martin Luther had addressed the issue, but they were confronting the problems. Um, it was a counter-reformation in the sense that the Pope was probably provoked to do more about it in a faster fashion than he might have done had the Reformation not happened. But a lot of the things that the Counter-Reformation was doing were things that the Catholics had known for a long time needed to be done, and they were doing them. So, we also call this the Catholic Reformation, or the Catholic Revival, which a lot of Catholics prefer because it, doesn't, it makes it sound like the Catholics were acting on their own ideas rather than just saying, oh, Martin Luther, we've got to fix this stuff. Um, the Counter-Reformation started and had its main push forward at a series of meetings known as the Council of Trent, where the church officials got together and said, you know, we've got to pull our socks up and see if we can get some things improved. They didn't necessarily reverse earlier decisions. For instance, they said that indulgences are actually okay. There's nothing wrong with indulgences. We realized that there were a lot of priests who were kind of overly pushy about it and and asking for indulgences to be paid in a way that was probably not a good way for priests to behave. So we're sorry about that, but indulgences are still okay. You can still pay them. Um, and some other things that happened in the Counter-Reformation or the Catholic Reformation were definitely progress, however. They were steps ahead. And one of the groups that was able to make a lot of this progress happen were the Jesuits, people who were members of the Society of Jesus, which, as I'm sure you know, still exists. There are Jesuits all over the place. Uh, this organization was founded in 1534 by St. Ignatius of Loyola, a very interesting character. He started out in the first part of his life being a rough and tough Spanish soldier who would just as soon run a sword through you as look at you. And he was in a big battle and was wounded, and he was in the hospital recuperating, and he had a religious change of heart, decided, you know, what I really want to do is be Christian and help other Christians. So he wrote a book, which was published in 1548, called Spiritual Exercises. And exercises they were. <laughs> it was, the book basically outlined a program of meditation and contemplation, which was kind of day by day. I mean, it's, you know, you wake up in the morning and you do you pray for two hours and then you read the Bible for an hour and a half and then you have a little bit of lunch and, you know, it's, it was a tough program to go through. Uh, but a lot of people like that, you know, the same reason they like to uh, join the army and, and live a very disciplined life. So um, the group that formed around Ignatius of Loyola is approved by the Pope in 1540, and when the um, Counter-Reformation gets started, the Jesuits are a very important part of it. Uh, one of the things that they do is they become missionaries. They travel all over the place. They go to places where no Christian had really ever been before. Um, and one of the important things in the history of the North American continent that they did, was a lot of them came over and um, were missionaries to the Native Americans. And they were very rough and tough. Uh, there's a movie from several decades ago called Black Robe, which I think gives a very effective picture of what these Jesuit missionaries had to do with. The Native Americans were not necessarily very welcoming of these Jesuits, and they would a lot of the Jesuits were tortured by the Native Americans. Uh, and, you know, the Jesuit had, would get finished with a session of being tortured, and he kind of limped back to his church, and in his diary, he's like, well, you know, they pulled off all my fingernails and toenails, but I think I'm getting to them, so I'm going to go back next week. <laughs> wow. Um, and one of the things you have to say about the Jesuits is that they were among the few Europeans who did not come to North America with the intention of taking away the Native American lands and killing them. Uh, they really wanted to help the Native Americans. They had their own ideas of what Native Americans needed, uh, but they protected the Native Americans from the other Europeans in a way that not many other Europeans were capable of undertaking. 
Another thing that the Jesuits did, which uh, is very visible in the world today, is that they established schools, colleges. Um, one of the ideas behind this was that the Christ, the Catholic Church had gotten this reputation for being kind of anti-intellectual. I mean, when Galileo Galilei had come up with all of his ideas about the way the universe was organized, he had been tried in front of the Catholic Church and sentenced to house arrest for the rest of his life, um, which made it look as if the Catholics were all against learning and the progress of intellectual endeavor, which they really weren't. Um, and the Jesuits were determined to prove otherwise by opening all sorts of schools and giving people a good education. Uh, a lot of the schools still in existence today were founded by Jesuits and are run by Jesuits. I, here I note that there are 168 college-level institutions in 40 different countries that are run by the Jesuits as of this year. Um, and a lot of the universities are named after St. Ignatius Loyola. One of the reasons we have so many educational institutions in the United States called Loyola, which is kind of confusing if you're trying to figure out which Loyola people are talking about, is that they were founded by Jesuits and they were named after St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the order. The, uh, as I say, one of the functions of the Jesuits was to provide good public relations for the Catholics, and they thought these schools were a good opportunity to do it. For one thing, many of the Jesuit colleges were built with beautiful architecture. Um, they are, in fact, you know, in uh, art history textbooks as examples of beautiful Renaissance architecture. Uh, and they found and figured out new ways of educating people in order to make them realize that being educated was fun. A lot of the people who had been going to universities before this time were um, going there either to become priests or in order to study for specific professions. But a lot of the upper nobility who wanted to send their children to school, not for any particular professional reason, because noblemen don't have to work for a living, but just because they wanted their children to be educated, would send them to Jesuit colleges where they would be sure of getting a good education. And, of course, the, as many people do who have a good time in college, these people would later on be supporters of the Jesuits and supporters of the Catholic Church in general. One of the fun things they did was to put on plays. Um, during the Middle Ages, there had not been a lot of very elaborate theater going on. I mean, there were these sort of little folk plays, the miracle and mystery plays that were being performed in town squares in various cities of England. But there weren't that many plays put on that took place in theaters with, you know, stage sets and things like that. One of the things the Jesuits were interested in helping their students to do was to learn to read and write and speak Latin. And so they thought, well, you know, if we write plays in Latin and the students have to memorize their lines in order to perform them in these plays, which they will presumably have fun putting on because students, lots of students enjoy putting on plays, then they will be learning Latin, and at the same time, the plays that we write will be all about Christian subjects, and will help people to learn about Christian morality. And uh, one of the side effects of this, which the Jesuits probably hadn't had in mind, but which turned out to be very productive for European culture, was that the idea of a high art drama began to come back to Western Europe. It's not unlikely uh, that if there had been the Jesuit drama, we might not have had playwrights like Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe, who wrote the plays that are considered to be great works of art today, because the Jesuits helped the theater to be taken seriously again after a long period of time in Western Europe where it was just sort of something that common people did for cheap entertainment. Well, I've come to the end of my row of pieces of paper. Uh, there is so much more to be said about the Renaissance, that, but I hope I've given you a kind of quick overall look at it and 
I hope you will all continue to study and read about it because it's a really fascinating a period, especially to us historians. Uh, for people like you, you may be bored stiff, but then why did you listen to this lecture all the way through? Think about that.